Welcome back to the Perfected Health Podcast. This is episode five. I am here with Christian Westbrook, aka the Ice Age Farmer, where we are going to discuss how we're being lied to about climate change and concerns about our food supply being controlled. What's going on, Christian? How are you? I'm great, Frankie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. So the two overarching issues that we have right now are really looking at the past climate temperature variants and how we're actually going into a cold period, uh, yet we're being told the opposite and how conventional agriculture isn't going to be able to function in these conditions. That's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And this conversation is a different one, I think, than it would have been even a year ago because it felt very speculative and forward looking. But at this point, we've seen, you know, the USDA just released the report. We've had five times the worst previous record of planting for this season. And that's pretty alarming. And we've also started to see this year canned food shortages in, uh, in big box grocery stores, Kroger's, Walmart, HEB. So these are, these are things that are pretty alarming and in your face. It's hard to ignore that. Um, fruit freedom was trending in China because of frosts that killed off a lot of the crop there and made fruit ridiculously expensive. So these are signs, if you're, if you're willing to look for them, that, um, that modern agriculture is really starting to experience, well, it's, it's failing, is, is to be blunt. And that's hard to, to look at and to really internalize and, and talk about when we depend on that every day to eat, but it's an important question to ask. So I'm glad that you're, that you're willing to open that can of worms. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think in America, people are so used to excess. You know, always have, you know, we hear about silos and silos full of grain, caves and caves full of cheese, how, how America has so much extra food, but, but that's not really true. Uh, you know, you said that it's five times worse than any other year so far. Uh, what are the most alarming things we're seeing right now uh, that, you know, people aren't really aware of? I mean, it takes a level of understanding to, to, to see these things and, and analyze what's going on. It is difficult. And unless you're, as you said, unless you're looking for it, it can be difficult to, I mean, the, the media just doesn't talk about it. Frequently, we've been having pretty catastrophic crop losses around the world lately. You know, Australia lost 10% of their entire ag market size off the top last year in the drought. Uh, the beast from the east was responsible for raising food prices across Europe. You saw some, some coverage there from, um, from media there. But, uh, but it really wasn't until this year that a blow came to the U.S. farmers that was so significant that it couldn't just be papered over. And so at this point, we're going to start to see this linkage more prominently made between the climate crisis, as they're now calling it, and then food scarcity and the fact that it's affecting our uh, dinner on our plate. People need to be worried about climate change pertaining to the food supply, and, and that's the main concern. But the media is saying that it's getting warmer. You know, they're kind of playing it off, you know, global warming and stuff. Has that message kind of shifted lately? Well, you have seen a deliberate and, and an, an explicit, they were actually issuing editorial guidance to all of their contributors, not to call it global warming, or it, it should now be called the climate emergency is the editorial guidance. And we've also seen, you know, basically the deplatforming of anyone that disagrees, uh, the BBC, USA Today, certainly Media Matters also is bothering Facebook and YouTube about removing anything that's, that's talking about um, the climate truth or climate in a way that doesn't support this ridiculous CO2 agenda, the hoax that's been perpetrated um, on that front. And so, yeah, the stakes are rising. What, what's the speculative reason that they're lying about it? it is, yeah, it's hard to, I agree. And so, you really have to be willing to look at, you know, there are open writings even as recently or up to a hundred years ago from the club of Rome and others who in their pursuit of a global world socialist system are, are willing to do anything. You know, their logo is the wolf in sheep's clothing. And that's, that's their slogan is wait until the time is right to strike. And it is the case. This is just the way it is that for the last hundred years, they have concocted this, uh, agenda of uh, the way they put it was we came up with the idea that man was the enemy of man and we can use that to change people's behavior. So in their pursuit to control us all, they, they just crafted this totalitarian CO2 hoax. And, you know, this is now the rubber is really needing the road. This is when they've been waiting for as the grand solar minimum and the climate changes that are happening right now and that we're seeing destroy our food system 
this is creating the urgency that, uh, that actually will allow them to push through that agenda for control. Let's take it a step back for a second. You know, most people are led to believe that the earth is warming, but we know it's actually cooling. And this is because of the grand solar minimum. Uh, if you could explain what that is. So when you look at the sun, most people are familiar with the fact that it goes through an 11 year sunspot cycle where there's a period at the maximum where it's got lots of activity, lots of sunspots. And then there's a, a trough where it drops off and that happens every 11 years. It's called the Schwab cycle. There are also larger cycles beyond that where that basic cycle is accentuated. It's called a grand maximum, like the one we've been enjoying for the past 100 years or so that's afforded us a strong magnetosphere and good stable growing seasons. Um, there are also times called grand minima where the sun, where those 11 year cycles drop, they're, they're muted in their activity, or in some cases they drop off completely and it's just a quiet sun. During those solar minima, uh, conditions are different on the planet. You know, it's, it's like I said, we've been enjoying the maximum for the last hundred years and we all got sort of fat and happy and used to that. And our growing is, is lazy in some cases, the way we've developed modern agriculture for a very bespoke set of conditions. And now those conditions are changing. And so during the solar minimum, um, what happens is that there's less solar wind coming from the sun. And among the changes in, in the output, what that means is that uh, we receive more galactic cosmic rays on Earth. And that drives volcanic activity, seismic activity. It changes the jet stream, it weakens it. So there are these meridional flows that, that mean Arctic air comes further south than it would otherwise, and vice versa, equatorial flows go further north. And that means that we, have, we experience that as temperature extremes. It gets really cold when the Arctic polar vortex comes down, uh, or you have hot and droughts. And these things are you know, ex temperature extremes, pre precipitation extremes, wreak havoc on crop production. And that's what's going on. That's why we saw catastrophic drought in Australia and the beast from the east. Again, it's that polar plunge coming down and wiping out fruit trees and you know, leafy greens, anything that's in that path gets wiped out. So simplifying this to a rise or drop in temperature is far, far too, e that'd be far too easy. That's way too incorrect. The, the, the sun cycle doesn't really have anything to do with temperature. It, it's changing a bunch of variables that pretty much mess up the climate. You know? So things, get, things are stable right now when the sun cycle is at the solar maximum. But when it goes to a solar minimum, what that essentially means is drastic weather changes and patterns. Yeah, and usually with a complex system, any absolute statement isn't, isn't true. But, but you're right. It's, it's not just that it, it, the sun drops off and it gets colder. That is generally true. Temperatures you know, in, the, in the wolf minimum dropped two degrees in Oberlach. They were recorded um, usually and, and frequently, I should say, that's, that's actually associated with the volcanic activity. There's a huge... VEI seven and that blows up ash and that results in uh, temperatures dropping. Mm -hmm. that how, how do they name these these periods? These past periods of, of sun cycles. Yeah, looking back, the last few grand minima cycles were named generally for the people that were studying the sun or or that that found the period. Um, and so that's where the Wolf minimum and the, the Monitor minimum and the Dalton minimum come from. Is the scientists who are looking into these sorts of things. And so, for example, during the Dalton minimum, there was a VEI-7 eruption of Mount Tambora, and that was in uh, 18, sorry, that was 1815, which resulted in 1816 being known as the year without a summer, where temperatures dropped across the Northern Hemisphere. It rained, ash fall, crops, you know, never had a chance to grow. That meant there was no food for the animals, and these things just cascade. It's very difficult when you don't have food, you can't feed your animals, people get weakened, and you end up eating through your seed supply, and then you don't have food to plant next year. So it's a, it's a really difficult situation. You see this playing out time and time again throughout history where the, the situation cascades, and it takes decades in some cases to recover you know, your health, and then your seed stock, and then the population. So we are in a grand solar maximum. We are heading into a grand solar minimum. And is this really an on and off switch? Are, are we expecting to see more of these events happening, more of these droughts, more of these crop losses, uh, more concern about the climate? Absolutely, yes. The, the, the drop-off can be and is currently precipitous that we're experiencing. Um, we've exited that grand maximum in modern grand maximum in 2008, um, according to you know, Wikipedia, unambiguously displays that. 
And uh, the, you know, there are conflicting models on what we're going into now, as always, as you would expect. Um, many of them show that we're going into a deep extended minimum. NASA last month somewhat begrudgingly finally conceded that we're going into at least a minimum that is on par with the Dalton minimum, which is, you know, as we just said, there was a quarter of the European urban population perished of starvation during that time. So this is something we need to take seriously and we need to understand those effects in the past and sort of map them on to how they will play out given our situation now. Some of the forecasts for this would be 30 to 40 years of, of this next grand minimum. So th this would actually explain and make a lot of sense as to why they would be telling people that, you know, meat causes climate change and CO2 emissions. I, I mean, they're trying to get people to stop eating meat, stop eating these foods they're used to eating because in the future, it's very likely that we're just, they're just going to be shoving whatever they can put together down our throats to keep us alive, essentially. I think more concerningly, it flows into what is a bid for, what is their bid for control that we were discussing, right? If they, um, you know, if they own and operate the fake meat and the cockroach milk and everything, the soylent, all these fake engineered foods, then the population completely depends on them to provide that soylent green every week, right? That we, we are literally their food slaves at that point. And that's the ultimate goal. You know, I watched, um, I also do, I watch some of your videos on the fake meat and the beyond, I watched you eating the beyond burger. And I talk about those guys a lot too. And sometimes, in fact, usually I'll get pushed back and, and somebody will say, you know, Christian, this is just some guy developing fake meat so that vegans have an alternative. Why would you be against alternatives? Why are you picking on this guy? And I just have to really drive this home that the CEO of Impossible Foods came out and said, we are here to replace, we are going to end animal agriculture. That was, I mean, his goal is, it's open, is to get rid of the, of the existing agricultural systems. You see this echoed by Plenty.ag, which is an indoor vertical farming startup. And there's, they've changed it now. Their slogan initially was, we are going to replace modern agriculture. And so they're very open. This is actually, you know, easier to see. Again, it's a different conversation now than it would have been a few years ago because these ag tech companies are openly telling us to our face, we're here to end agriculture and to take control over your food supply. This is, this is really scary. I mean, I mean, I'm assuming these burgers and these cockroach milks and all of these foods are able to be produced in grand, I mean, well, the solar minimum conditions, you know, the very, I mean, if there's droughts, if there's crop issues, I'm assuming that these plant foods and, and what they're selling beyond meat, cockroach milk are designed to be able to be produced regardless. Yeah, absolutely. It's all the lab grown meat that, that's been talked about also for 100 years. They, they have this plan to sell culture meat and do it in the cities and then grow food in the cities and make the, uh, the, the countryside slaves to the city's food production. It's a weird inversion of the natural order of things. And they're very into that. Um, yeah, I mean, the GMO, these, all of these things that, that can seem disparate are actually integral parts of this agenda to, to take total control over the food supply. You know, Wendy's has taken all of their uh, tomato growth into, uh, into greenhouses to try and get away from climate changes. We saw Walmart patenting robotic bees because, again, they're replacing agriculture. They're building these robot bees to go in their automated greenhouses that will be raising crops with technical precision and then delivering them via robots to you know the, the shelves that they own you see the same thing again plenty.ag was funded by jeff bezos who owns the distribution network of whole foods to bring his products straight from the farm they want to own the entire supply chain from from top to bottom it's amazing to think that less than 100 years ago you know 1950s 1960s 1970s you know, the USDA dietary guidelines didn't exist. You know, people were still healthy. They were still happy. They were still eating animal foods. You know, we were still in fairly good health. You know, 1979, you know, these dietary guidelines come along, uh, vegetable oils, seed oils, refined foods, carbohydrates, sugar, pretty much destroy the health of America. And then, you know, chronic disease rates skyrocket. And now we're getting to a point where I'm curious how much longer you know, humans can exist without, you know, these bodybuilding nutrients of animal foods. I mean, humans on a cockroach milk and, you know, soylent diet would, would go extinct in a matter of generations. It's just a question of how long would it take to go extinct? Because, you know, different people have different tolerances to, 
these diets. And it could be as sad as a baby being miscarried, a child dying of cancer, uh, to a person just maybe not living as long. And it, it really seems like that's where we're going. And it's, it gets me curious if, if this is all, you know, some crooked plan they had in their heads the whole time, or if there was a time where, you know, this, this type of, you know, rule didn't exist. Oddly, it has been the plan in their head the entire time. It, it is odd, but uh, that's the way it is. And there are some opportunities that that creates for us to, to build better systems, to grow healthier food and, and uh, you know, start communities that are doing things right. But, uh, but doing so requires first having a firm understanding of, of all these things we're talking about so that we can make the right decisions. Yeah, there's a little bit of controversy lately in like the ketogenic and carnivore area, at least with my YouTube channel on like grain fed versus grass fed meat. And a lot of people are saying, oh, I can't afford grass fed, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot bigger than that. It's far bigger than that. You're literally supporting a system that is basically trying to destroy human life uh, for, for any positive, you know, and that, that's what I'm looking at. You know, you buy that grain fed steak, you don't care about humanity in general. You know, you're buying that grass fed steak, that local farm steak, you know, you're trying to do your part in contributing to, to the future. As, as crazy as that sounds, that's the reality of the situation. And yes, on an individual basis, does it make a difference? Probably not. But if everyone starts doing that and people start started, you know, even trying to, I mean, I'm sure we could talk about people purchasing their own land, raising their own animals and, and pr providing food for themselves. Th this goes into the special interest funding in every single food group. Uh, you know, from veganism to, to grain-based meat diets uh, to farm-raised fish. It's, it's so difficult to fight against these people and, and get the word out there and explain why what's going on. People, people are too naive. Most people are not going to, to believe this stuff and, and understand why it's so important. And at the end of the day, most of them simply won't care about it. Yeah, you're dead on, except I have to take issue with one thing, Frankie, and that is, I think it absolutely makes a difference when an individual starts growing their own food or even removes their support from the toxic agriculture and makes the right decisions. Every, every dollar we move away from those coppers helps us build a healthier future. And that's why I started my YouTube channel to encourage people to do that, because I do think we make a difference. Um, yeah, you mentioned the, the new, you know, the USDA guidelines, and we recently saw Canada redraw theirs just within the year uh, and, and totally removed dairy. Dairy farmers were saying, what's, what's going on here? You've totally taken out milk and beef. This is, this is a weird, it's, it's like Canada has gone totally plant-based. And just last week now they're saying, we're going to realign something else to make it in line with this. So it's, it's, it's building this, this case is building and, um, and it is a replacement. You know, another, another tell just happened a couple of days ago when a university um, goldsmiths in London banned meat from their campus. So this is absolutely an attack on the food system. It's moving forward. The whole idea behind it is, is, is being disguised as trying to make people healthier and, and improving the planet, when in reality, all of it has to do with, I mean, the lie that they're keeping from you, you know, the grand solar minimum, uh, you know, the idea that we're not going to have access to these animal foods in the future. At the end of the day, they want to control the food supply. They want to have everyone at their mercy, essentially. They don't want people on their own, providing food for themselves and, and being healthy. I mean, I'm a pessimistic person, so I'm under the belief that, you know, it's, they've been doing this for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years and getting away with it. So I don't, people just aren't going to stop them. On one hand, you do want to think that, you know, there is some good in this world and that there are some people that are trying to, to set things straight. And, and then you just go to the appeal to authority, though, you know, as people listen to doctors, people listen to the government, people listen to police, and, and that's just how it is. It's uh, certainly an issue. Uh, I mean, you know, on, on one hand, you know, I spend a lot of my time, uh, you know, focusing on, you know, making health videos and trying to educate people. On the other hand, it's kind of like, well, at least hopefully, maybe it doesn't affect me, but in the future, you know, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's a bit, I mean, it's, it is a bit, for, we just have to remember, this is what people have done throughout history. This is why Stalin killed off the farmers in Ukraine to take control. This is, the only difference is this time it's a global agenda and it's a, it's a permanent destruction of, of the food system. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that um, we should talk a little bit more about how the, 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 the food and the vegan, the, you know, the, 
I don't want to call it the vegan agenda because then people think we're talking about diets, but it's a bid for control over the food system and how that's marrying with the climate agenda. You know, we just saw um, a new IPCC report that said the way we grow food and even what we eat is going to have to change if we're going to get out of this climate emergency. And they were Greenpeace, you know, protesters out in front of the building with their sign saying, uh, less meat, less heat. So they're, they're aligning these two things and it's, that's the mechanism by which they'll translate these food scarcity into further control. Yeah. These people that, that are protesting, I mean, the, the vegans, all these people, the majority of these people are simply brainwashed. So, so we do have some paid influencers, some special interest groups that put certain people in pedestals, whether it's, you know, a vegan with a million subscribers on YouTube, whether it's, you know, a ketogenic diet or with hundreds of thousands of subscribers on YouTube, they put these people in these places. And it seems like everyone that's a piece of the puzzle doesn't really know what's going on, you know, kind of in it for themselves, doing their own thing and, and don't realize that they are literally contributing to uh, the downfall of society from that perspective. And it's, you know, you got to have compassion to some extent because when the people that are contriving these things have had hundreds of years to prepare and to implement them and to put the predictive programming and the scripting in there for everybody, it's, it's I mean, you got to give them credit. It's well executed. It's well conceived. It's just devious. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you look at these Extinction Rebellion folks who are saying, we should just all stop having babies. That's the only solution. And you can tell, I mean, it's, 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 it's a dangerous situation, honestly, Frankie, because we are all in a situation and it will continue to, to accelerate down this direction as food shortages become more pronounced, right? Already, you can't find canned vegetables at Walmart. And that's, that, that creates like a, a problem for people who feed their family every week from that store because the, there's like this implicit promise that I'm going to go there and I'm going to get food and I don't have to think about this. I have a job that gives me money so that I can go get those things. And that's how the whole thing works. But if money doesn't buy food anymore, I'm not going to go to my job anymore. You know, there's, there's a lot hanging on this. I think one of two things will happen as that, as that mental tension grows, as the, as the food shortages worsen. People will either hunker down even more, just, you know, go extinction rebellion style. We should all be dead anyway. We're killing the planet and just sort of lose their, lose their shit. Or they'll actually say, this is what's, this is really a pain point for me. I'm trying to feed my family and it's getting more difficult. What's going on here? And it's those people that have that strength and courage and intellectual curiosity for whom I still have hope. And, and I, I think, you know, we're all in this together and it's because I'm confident there are a lot of people out there who will ask those questions going forward that I'm doing what I'm doing right now. I, I mean, in general, before coming into this conversation, you know, I had an idea of this new world order stuff. You know, I had an idea of, you know, them trying to essentially, you know, control and manipulate everyone. But th this brings new light to the severity of the situation and, and how we are actually going to be in a position where decisions have to be made basically. You know, this isn't something that's, you know, we're just going to be molded into society and things are going to work out well. It, high likelihood of something catastrophic happening. Is this something that, you know, we have a solution for? Is there a possibility that, you know, moving towards local farming, moving towards growing your own food? I mean, I mean, this would have to be done on a very high level. You mean at a large scale? Yeah. And there are people who, you know, who've, who've, devised large scale plans where we build floating islands near the equator so that we can continue to, and these kinds of things that, that involve state action. And in fact, you know, Valentina Zarkova, who's one of the uh, professors who's done models of the sun and is warning people and governments alike about the coming grand solar minimum and the likely food shortages that will result because of a reduced vegetation season. Uh, those are her words. So this solar physicist mathematician team is coming up with these models. And she's also going, as I said, to governments and trying to encourage them to prepare their people. But I don't think, you know, I think she's barking up the wrong tree. As much as I re wholly respect her work, I think the solutions are going to be a bottom up situation here. They have already telegraphed their intention to lie to us about what's going on here as long as possible. You know, even just yesterday, the USDA's new report 
that said, we're going to have even more corn this year than we expected. It's just ludicrous given how late the crop is. You know, the week before the USDA released a report that said all the, the corn is at least four to six weeks behind. And if that's the case, then you just don't, you don't see those kinds of yields. Um, farmers are pretty, pretty burned up right now. There's a lot of emotions. Emotions are running high across the, uh, the U.S. certainly right now because that, it's based on those corn numbers that they'll get their insurance payoffs. And so again, it's, this further evidence is what I'm trying to establish is a across the board attack on farmers, ranchers, independent food producers, and our ability to, food, to feed ourselves. What's the time frame? You know, these, these people have been hiding the secret from us. Do we really know how many years from now they're going to have to face reality? Only God knows for sure. You know, there's a chance that we have a nice solar cycle 25. We just finished cycle 24 and would be going into 25 now. And so there's a chance that, and in fact, Dr. Zarkova expects that 25 will bide us some time, will give us a bit of time before we descend into really the, you know, the grand solar minimum. And that what we're seeing now is, is a window into how that's going to play out for us. So if there's, you know, one could, could sort of argue that if we can make it through this next year or two here and just find our footing, then we have a window of time to, to prepare. But uh, as an individual, that would be true of, of the big picture. As an individual, given everything else we've stated, you know, the, the war on food is already taking place. So even if we're given that respite from serious degradation of our natural growing seasons, I think the urgency stays. I think we should all be taking steps today, now, every day to move ourselves and our families and eventually our communities off of these failing systems and building resilient, new, better, healthier, non-toxic ones. I mean, this is literal. I mean, the real solution here is pretty much everyone being on a farmstead or almost living off of the land themselves. And, and that's the, the true way, you know, for sustainable food production. Of course, you know, you could have, you know, the farmers growing animal foods, you know, in sustainable ecosystems, but we don't have the support for that yet. You know, there's a reason, you know, New York state isn't completely populated with grass fed beef farmers because people aren't going to, you know, consume a large percentage of their calories from the foods they should be eating. The support system is not there. This whole problem is, is very difficult to solve from every perspective. You know, first people have to understand, you know, the importance of animal foods in the diet. You know, second, they have to understand that these are the only foods that we will probably be able to, to grow and, and raise in a natural way that's sustainable in the environment for a long period of time. And then you have to get them to spend the money to support the food or, or envision that as, as the future. And I mean, that's something that I've always wanted to personally do. And, you know, I've, I've always been saving up money uh, to hopefully do something like that myself. But I, I can't really see, you know, the general population facing that reality. I, I mean, it's one thing if you had some sort of system where, you know, they just started throwing people out into the middle of the United States, you know, some, some wacko stuff and expected them to farm. I, I mean, taking it back to, you know, educating people, trying to get the word out. I, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's really all we could do. And be an example, right? Lead by example, start to move yourself and your family away from those, you know, growing your own food and away from those systems. Um, I think by setting that example and being the change is, is just a huge part. And then, yeah, education, spreading the word has to happen. And my hope and prayer is that there are many smart people, smarter than I, hearing about what's going on. And as they come into awareness and, and do their research and then figure out, dude, we got to do something about this, then there are going to be you know, people that work with fungi to remediate um, bee diseases, this is a thing out there, and we can integrate that and really help to nourish the honeybees back to health. And there will be regenerative grazing experts who say, oh, well, if this is going on, then there's a need for people like me to spread the word and get other people doing these kinds of, you know, permaculture style uh, grazing arrangements where there's a holistic system and a virtuous cycle producing more and more food for a community. Um, there are, you know, Th that's the good news, Frankie, is that there are people who for generations have been working on solving some of these problems. And even before these people, humanity has always lived and been responsible for feeding ourselves, right? Historically, it hasn't been until very recently that we've been so disconnected from the act of cultivation, which I think is actually a very a human thing, a very innate, important part of our lives. But when you look at, and I think that's, that's you can tell that's true, 
when you look at indigenous cultures and traditions, like the Hopi, um, when I talked to a Hopi dry farmer, and there was only so much he was willing to get into because it's extremely personal and it's, it's private for their, for their tribe. But the, the crux of it was that it's not just growing food to them. It's, it's a relationship with the earth and with their food. And, and we lack, certainly we lack that relationship to the earth at this point. And a lot of us are still disconnected from our food, which is why people eat that, that, that weird toxic stuff in the grocery store. What people forget is those indigenous people, those hunter gatherers, their lives, their job, you know, their nine to five job was to procure food, to sustain themselves, to survive. The, the major part of surviving as a human being is obtaining animal calories, farming, all of that stuff. And, and I've said this in, in the past, our jobs should be being on the farm, getting food for ourselves and, and providing food for each other. If we're not doing that, then what should we be doing as human beings? Because you know, whether it was the hunter gatherers that were hunting animals and, and gathering wild plants or, you know, the more settled indigenous civilizations, you know, that had some animal husbandry and farming practices, at the end of the day, the amount of knowledge they had in what they were doing is, is, is I mean, it's definitely something we've lost. It gets really crazy when you see, you know, the hundreds of animal food and the thousands of plant foods that these people used to know. And it's, it's kind of a pipe dream for me for, to get back to that to some degree. Uh, that's, that's definitely some sort of a fantasy, but uh, it can definitely be made a reality for some people uh, as long as the seed gets planted. I, I say this on my channel a lot. Like, if I'm the best you guys got, like, you guys are shit out of luck. Like, I'm really hoping there's somewhere out there that's 10 times smarter than me because if there isn't, we are all screwed. Yeah, well said. That's what, exactly what I mean when I say I hope there's someone smarter than me that is finding out about this, that's watching this, and that can come on and, and really move the needle as far as it's going to take all of us. It's going to take every one of us because we all come from different backgrounds. We have different experiences. We have diff, you know, access to different parts of, of what we've collectively forgotten. And, uh, and we're all going to have to bring those parts to the table to get through this. The problem I have is since people can't afford or support local agriculture or, or do these things, they just dismiss them and, and forget about them and don't care about what the actual message is and what we're trying to do. You know, this much larger idea of, you know, literally controlling the food supply for the world is what they're influencing. And it's not just about, you know, their day to day paycheck, you know, what they're eating, what they're able to do. It's, it's a, uh, it's tough to, to put people in that position, but they definitely have to know about it. Yeah, and I, and I hear what you're saying. When, when you're already feeling overwhelmed with the myriad stresses of life, like it's just, this is the last thing we need is another thing to, to, to and a huge thing to try and even deal with. But, um, but it is where we are now. And I think, you know, when we turn, turn the other cheek and just start chipping away at it, we just start taking, you know, I call it daily steps, whatever it is, just take, do something today to bring yourself closer to a state of being self-sufficient, of having resilient food storage. And, you know, I hear really inspiring stories from um, some viewers who are in urban environments and started, you know, I, at one point on my channel was growing crickets as protein source. And um, some of my viewers started doing that as well. And uh, one of them actually started finding that he was, there was a market for crickets, that there are people who have lizards in his town. And so he was able to sell these crickets that, you know, once you literally, once you start growing them, that's basically free. So he's just kind of printing money under his bed. This is a very small space, you know, in a closet, an apartment. And that became a new source of income for, for him, which is great because now he can build, right? The daily steps, they build, they take you closer, even if it feels trivial and, and just, you know, um, pointless another guy um went out to meetings you know doesn't he, again he doesn't have access to a garden of his own and so you can feel defeated and just sort of whine about your situation but he chose instead to turn the other cheek to go out and find at master gardener meetings um folks who basically who who had those years of experience but were now too old and frail to keep working their own gardens and so he walked right up to him and said hi i, I introduce myself. I'd love to be, help you with your garden. I'll work it for you. And maybe I can take three or four rows of, of produce and you can help yourself to the rest. And, uh, and so he's lined up gradually a series of six farms across Memphis that he's working for people. And uh, you know, part of also what's cool about that is that once he does some of that cleanup, that the, uh, the old ladies will, will just come out and be so excited at, at seeing their garden producing again, that they start working on it too. And it's just great to see them come back to life. 
but uh, but I love that story because and now again he he was able to to parlay that into a hospital approached him and said we'd like you to manage our garden for us and that's a that's a big job and he's hiring help to do it so he's turned this with no experience in growing whatsoever into a career for himself and I just I bring these two examples to the table because they are what happens when you decide to go for it anyway. It feels pointless. There's no path. I don't see any way this actually materially helps me tomorrow, but I got to do it anyway. It's the right thing to do. And it, it just might work out. It frequently does. And this could be anything from, you know, growing some vegetables in your backyard, you know, maybe going to a farmer's market more often once a week, you know, maybe setting some money aside to, to do something like that in the future. It doesn't have to be an all-in kind of thing. And I think that's really important. I mean, reality is, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people in the United States aren't even aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the alarming part. But I, I do think that we're at a turning point now. And that's what happens when there are suddenly food shortages in the stores in the United States. People are going to say, this wasn't supposed to happen. And a lot of them will ask, what's going on here? And so we all need to be out there evangelizing a little bit, being a little bit uncomfortable with how loud we're being so that people, you know, leaving breadcrumbs for these folks to follow as they start to ask those questions. A lot of like the, the discussion in the context of what we've spoken about is kind of like America focused almost in a way. What we've, what we've talked about applies to just the whole world in general to some degree, even though people are already struggling in some places to have food. It does apply to the whole world. Absolutely. And what What's actually concerning is that the wealthier nations are simply better able to mask this and, and sort of stave off the emergency for a while. Certainly you see you know, places like Madagascar, Zimbabwe, they're already experiencing Kenya, they're already experiencing food shortages that are, that are unparalleled in, in what's going on right now. And um, in many cases, you know, it's, it's interesting, you'll see aid workers say, we just need to get seed to these people, which also tells you that they're actually a little bit better situated than we in some ways because they still know how to grow those food, those crops if we can get the seed to them. Whereas in the US, you know, I have a chart here that's it's, it's one of the scariest charts I have. And it's a chart of how many people are involved with producing food in the US. And that number has dwindled down to about 2% right now. And so that's, it's, yeah, that's a real concern that even if people wanted suddenly to, you know, to do their best to grow their own food, it would be a tremendous educational effort. So the real solution here ties into local agriculture, whether it's growing your own food, supporting these food systems, you know, buying that steak once a week at the farmer's market. As long as you're not putting money in the hands of pretty much any corporation or company. I mean, you know, if you're shopping at Whole Foods, you're shopping at Trader Joe's, you're shopping at uh, you know, whatever local supermarket you have, you know, you're buying grain-fed beef, you're buying farm-raised fish, you're, you're supporting you know, these operations as opposed to you know, a privately owned business, a local farmer, or, or growing your own food. Yeah, personally, for me, that's part of it. And I think you know, I chose to, my family chose to move out of the cities so that we would have a bit more space to start growing our own food and doing these sorts of things. Um, you know, room for the compost pile and all those things you would expect to have. And, um, and yeah, the, the, the charge to us each is to depart from those failing systems because not only are they explicitly uh, created to take control over us, they're actively failing. They're not reliable anyway. And they're delivering to us toxic food, right? Your audience is really well aware of that. So I think all of these underscore the need to, to start producing our own food, yeah. I mean, to sum this up very simply, you know, we're being lied to about the climate. Uh, the planet's going to turn into a giant ice cube and we need to grow our own broccoli. Uh, I, I want to avoid the ice cube reference because I think it's, it's more accurate to say that the climate will become much less stable, that the growing seasons will, will suffer as a result of this. But, uh, but it is simple. Yeah, once you, get, once you wrap your head around the fact of, the, of what's going on, that it's happened before in history and that it's playing out right now in front of us, that you can watch the headlines as if it's, it's, I mean, it's just a slow motion train wreck. Christian, I can't, Thank you enough for doing this. Uh, I mean, you know, I had a lot of ideas before this. I knew a lot of things pertaining to this, but uh, you really pieced everything together and, and made it really simple and I uh, have almost created a message that I'm probably going to start really pushing more and sharing with people. Uh, so where can people find you? Well, first, I just want to say thank you for opening up your platform for this message, which I do believe is absolutely critical at this time. And also thanks for, for doing what you do. You know, I, you bring a lot of passion to the truth that you speak. And I, I think, you know, that's, that's awesome. We need more people doing that. 
Um, I can absolutely be found. You know, clearly, I've got the Ice Age Farmer YouTube channel, but those are um, easy come, easy go these days. So I would actually recommend going directly to iceagefarmer.com where I post everything and it's linked not just to YouTube, but BitChute and DTube and a few other ways that we can make sure these things stay around on the blockchain. And uh, yeah, you can also find me on patreon.com or subscribestar.com slash iceagefarmer. And I appreciate it. Hey, thanks again, Christian. I will have all of his links down in the description below, uh, as well as a link at the end here. This has been the Perfected Health Podcast, episode five. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.